Hi everyone, I'm Jack the Rambling Racketeer and I hope that you're doing well. I'd like to discuss Notes of a Native Son by James Baldwin, which is a wonderful collection of essays. It's his first collection, published in 1955 when he was only 31 years old. And it's a, re a really great introduction for anyone who's never read James Baldwin. He has numerous novels that are fantastic. He was a very prolific essayist. Uh, but Notes of a Native Son is, is in part fascinating because Baldwin seems to spring fully formed, fully developed in terms of his style, in terms of his sensibility, in terms of his interests and the wide range of interests he has in this first collection of essays. Um, and I think part of that is probably due to his upbringing. As an adolescent, he was, a, he was a preacher. And so he would preach a couple of times a week and spent his teenage years forming, in a sense, verbal essays, crafting those, drawing on his autobiography, drawing on uh, the his own interests, uh, his, his community, his reading, and fusing all of that together in a, in a very you know tight, focused, coherent sense. And that's on display in his essays. And it's on display throughout the essays <laughs> across his career. There's always a great sense of passion, a deep love, both for humans and for language, um, and, and a sense of wit, a sense of humor um, that allows him to sort of uh, press forward despite the oppression he experiences, both racism and homophobia. Um, despite that, he, he continues to, to feel that he's growing as a person, that he can connect with communities. And that, that is at the heart of uh, so many of his works. But Notes of a Native Son, as I said, is a great, great introduction um, to Baldwin's interests. He draws on his autobiography, he has an essay in here that's uh, describing his experiences when his father passed away and the uh, issues, the anger, the tension he had with his father having left ministry um, and, and the ways in which he, he could still feel his father's influence and, and the conflict they'd had even after his father had passed away. And he draws parallels on that around um, uh, racial issues that were happening there in Harlem right around that same time as his father had, had died. Uh, he goes in to examine um, portrayals of African Americans both in film and in literature, examining Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harry Beecher Stowe, and of course, famously, Native Son by Richard Wright, uh, although that's not really the notes of a Native Son essay. <laughs> um, that's Many Thousands Gone is the essay that's on Native Son. And he drew criticism for criticizing Native Son and, and identifying along with Ralph Ellison that there were perhaps some limitations in what Wright had accomplished. I happen to think Native Son's a wonderful, wonderful book, an amazing, amazing uh, piece of work that I have reread a couple of times. But uh, as Baldwin continues his to this foray of, you know, in survey of his interests, we begin to then uh, dig beyond sort of arts and culture in his autobiography to see the experiences of segregation, to see experiences of racism. Later on in his essays, he would examine homophobia as well. Um, but in these early ones, it's, it's more focused on race. And the civil, this is 10 years before the Civil Rights Act. And so he is uh, very incisive as a critic. He doesn't pull back and want to uh, search for like, well, I understand this side and I understand that side too. He, he's very, he's always willing to admit that the people who are oppressors or persecuting um, blacks and, and persecuting him personally or his brother are human beings. And he sees that, he sees, uh, and, and, and always at, um, evinces a great love for other humans, but he's also uh, very uncompromising. And he was, all, you know, throughout his career. But as he, uh, he, he writes one essay in particular, that's very almost comical in terms of the sarcasm he has when his brother's singing group goes down to Atlanta to canvass for the Progressive Party in 1948. And what a disaster that is. Uh, thankfully, everybody comes home safely. But he, he describes the experiences his brother had, how they, they thought they were coming down for a singing tour to make some money. And instead, they were just being asked to go out and try to canvass for voters. And what a nightmare experience they had. And, and ultimately, the, the racism they experienced, the very real fear they experienced when they have to leave and get out safely back to New York. Uh, but it's his final section of essays that are set in Paris and Switzerland that are particularly interesting. He describes uh, spending a week in a French jail when he takes the sheet that a friend, he, he met, meets a fellow American there in Paris, and they just the kind of, because they're the only two who are from the same country and speak each other's language at this cafe, they hit it off, they end up hanging out, uh, becoming friends, and when the friend... In, in anger, uh, leaves the hotel he's been staying at that was charging too much and ripping him off. He steals the sheet, you know, just to stick it to him. And this is just a common practice. 
Well, Baldwin's she ha sheets haven't been washed, so the friend offers it to him. And then a couple days later, the police come looking for the stolen sheet, and they're both in trouble. And so Baldwin um, has this 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 essay in which he's going through these this story that seems comical. It's anecdotal. Uh, he has his, his the, the the quirks, the experiences, the fears he's experiencing, but it gradually takes on this deeper and deeper tone of fear and of horror. As you can see, he's he's thinking through what might this be like if I was experiencing this in Georgia, where my brother had been, you know, not so recently. Um, I should say fairly recently, and he 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 never quite goes in that direction. But there's this undercurrent that exists within the essay. Um, and that he, do, he doesn't feel the need to go in and spell that out for everybody, despite being a very passionate writer. Uh, he doesn't need to spell that out. It's just there, and it, it hangs over uh, many of the pages in that essay. But his final essay, Stranger in the Village, is probably the highlight of this collection. And I think it's the essay that points the direction for what Baldwin would do in later works. Uh, Nobody Knows My Name was very much a, it was subtitled More Notes of a Native Son. Um, the Fire Next Time is a masterpiece that I think a huge number of people have read. And even later on, essays like The Price of uh, the Ticket is are critical. But he shares his experiences going to a small rural Swiss village in which it seems most of the people there have never seen someone who's black, whether an African-American, uh, an Afro-Caribbean, an African, they've just never seen anybody. And so he describes his experiences there. And as he does, he begins to examine how this deep, strange experience he's having, staying with um, a friend's family there in this very small village, just a couple hundred people. And they have, they have one church, they have one school that doesn't even really seem to go up to high school. Uh, and and he, he's describing just what it feels like to, to feel the other in this village. And to have the, the, the first year he was there, some of the kids would come up and like touch his hand to see if uh, the pigmentation on his skin would rub off onto them or they would feel his hair. They'd never seen hair like that. That the word they would use in French to refer to him as black sounded a lot to his ears like the N word. And that initially it was constantly bringing up these moments of from his past of experiencing, you know, deep, hateful racism. And that that wasn't what he was experiencing here but it still it still drew on that on that trauma. Um, but he, as this essay continues, he begins to examine what it means to be black in in the United States. When one considers the history of the Negro in America, it is of the greatest importance to recognize that the moral beliefs of a person or a people are never really as tenuous as life, which is not moral. Very often causes them to appear. These create for them a frame of reference and a necessary hope. The hope being that when life has done its worst, they will be enabled to rise above themselves and to triumph over life. Life would scarcely be bearable if this hope did not exist. Again, even when the worst has been said, to betray a belief is not by any means to have put oneself beyond its power. The betrayal of a belief is not the same as thing as ceasing to believe. If this were not so, there would be no moral standards in the world at all. Yet one must also recognize that morality is based on ideas and that all ideas are dangerous. Dangerous, because ideas can only lead to action. And where the action leads, no man can say. And dangerous in this respect, that confronted with the impossibility of remaining faithful to one's beliefs and the equal impossibility of becoming free of them, one can be driven to the most inhuman excesses. The, idea, the ideas on which American beliefs are based are not, though Americans often seem to think so, Ideas which originated in America, they came out of Europe, and the establishment of democracy on the American continent was scarcely as radical a break with the past as was the necessity which Americans faced of broadening this concept to include black men. This was literally a hard necessity. It was impossible for one thing, for Americans to abandon their beliefs, not only because these beliefs alone seemed able to justify the sacrifices they had endured and the blood that they had spilled, but also because these beliefs afforded them their only bulwark against a moral chaos as absolute as the physical chaos of the continent it was their destiny to conquer. But in the situation in which Americans found themselves, these beliefs threatened an idea which, whether or not one likes to think so, is the very warp and woof of the heritage of the West, the idea of white supremacy. And he goes on to examine uh, this sense of what does it mean to have a belief or to have an idea that feels like it's, it's your overarching core and then to be confronted on a daily basis as the people who in this Swiss village are not, 
because they're not, and he goes on to describe the ways in which uh, in the 1950s under the, the sort of many of the last vestiges of colonial power from Europe uh, are still extant, that the, the sense of racism is so distant that people from Africa, or, or he doesn't say, but people from India or Asia are so far away and the, the oppression exists o over there that it feels distant, it doesn't feel immediate, and it doesn't feel like something that has to be examined and confronted and, and reconciled, uh, <laughs> hypocritically or otherwise, on a daily basis. But in the US it's different because if there are these claims for freedom and these claims, claims for equality, but then segregation still exists. Um, he goes on, lynch law still exists. And these were very real occurrences. Um, they were realities that that is constantly pushing back against those claims of freedom and equality. Uh, and and it, the, the essay continues, um, and, and he goes, at the root of the American Negro problem is the necessity of the American white man to find a way of living with the Negro in order to be able to live with himself. And towards the end, he, uh, he, he identifies talking about himself, his survival depended and his development depends on his ability to turn his peculiar status in the Western world to his own advantage, speaking about those who've experienced racism. And it may be to the very great advantage of that world. It remains for him to fashion out of his experience that which will give him sustenance, sustenance and a voice. The cathedral at Chartres, I have said, says something to the people of this village which can, it cannot say to me. But it is important to understand that this cathedral says something to me which it cannot say to them. Perhaps they are struck by the power of the spires, the glory of the windows. But they have known God, after all, longer than I have known him, and in a different way. And I am terrified by the slippery, bottomless well to be found in the crypt, down which heretics were hurled to death, and by the obscene, inescapable gargoyles jutting out of the stone, and seeming to say that God and the devil can never be divorced. I doubt that the villagers think of the devil when they face a cathedral, because they have never been identified with the devil. But I must accept the status which myth, if nothing else, gives me in the West before I can hope to change the myth. And he, he, towards the end, people who shut their eyes to reality simply invite their own destruction. And anyone who insists on remaining in a state of innocence long after that innocence is dead, turns himself into a monster. The time has come to realize that the interracial drama acted out on the American continent has not only created a new black man, it has created a new white man too. No road whatever will lead Americans back to the simplicity of this European village where white men still have the luxury of looking on me as a stranger. I am not really a stranger any longer for any American alive. And he ends with this incredible sentence. It is precisely this black and white experience which may prove of, ind uh, I should, for even when the worst has been, um, here we go. This fact, faced with all its implications, it can be seen that the history of the American Negro problem is not merely shameful, referring to the experiences of slavery, the, the experiences of segregation, the horrors, as it is also something of an achievement. For even when the worst has been said, it must also be added that the perpetual challenge posed by this problem will, was always, somehow, perpetually met. It is precisely this black-white experience which may prove of indispensable value to us and the world we face today. The world is white no longer and it will never be white again. And what, a, what an outstanding closing uh, and summation to the many ways in which Baldwin has been exploring culture, exploring society, exploring his own autobiography and a larger history and, and community history throughout Notes of a Native Son. Um, as I said, this is a fantastic uh, collection and it, it really does give uh, a sense of who Baldwin would be as a novelist. As a novelist, of course, we have great autobiographical works, um, including Go Tell on the Mountain, and I think to a certain extent Giovanni's Room. But then there, there is this sense of development in Baldwin that he uh, begins to shift away from autobiography, and that by the time his later novels have been reached, Tell Me How Long the Train's Been Gone, uh, he's dealing with uh, characters who, who are very much not living his life and, and drawing on just purely his own experiences. Um, if Beale Street could talk, he has uh, a, a protagonist and, and a sort of a narrator who's a woman. Um, and then finally, just above my head, is very much this return to form. Uh, it, it feels like it's, it's, it's not a sequel to Go Tell on the Mountain, but it feels like it's, it's drawing on so many of those traditions, so many of those ideas, except fusing them with uh, so much that Baldwin has learned in the ways in which society has and has not changed 
in the intervening uh, roughly 30, 20, 25, 30 years between the two books being written. Um, so he's a wonderful novelist. As I mentioned, of course, as well, the book is deeply informed by Richard Wright's Native Son. And I think there are ways in which Baldwin, uh, along with uh, Ralph Ellison, took ideas Richard Wright had and, and sort of drew them in two different directions. I think um, Ellison, his essay collection, Shadow and Act, is very focused on um, on writers like Ralph, uh, sorry, Richard Wright, but also on music, just like, you know, and, and, and the arts and his own autobiography. Very, very comparable, I think, to what Baldwin accomplished in Notes of a Native Son. This is another great, great book I can't recommend highly enough. Uh, another writer who was deeply influenced by Baldwin was uh, Toni Morrison, The Source of Self-Regard, uh, which is a collection of her essays and um, uh, it includes a eulogy as well, uh, her eulogy for James Baldwin. And I had mostly recently read Sula by Morrison, but I think there are ways in which jazz perhaps feels um, maybe the most Baldwin-esque of her works, of her wonderful fiction. And then a book that I haven't read yet, but that seems to perhaps be a parallel, would be The Stone Face by William Gardner Smith, uh, who had grown up in the U.S. and was black, but then uh, emigrated to Paris and was living there sort of feeling like he was experiencing a different, um, a, a different level of equality until Algeria, the, the war for Algerian independence grew. And then he started to see the ways in which people uh, treated him differently. Um, as, as a black American expatriate living in France, uh, while they were, they were viewing, having such negative and, and racist and, and colonialist views towards Algerians at the same time. So the stone face seems like it, it'll be in my reading in the near future. But let me know what your favorite work is from Baldwin. As I said, his, his not, he has so many good novels and excellent novels. It's hard to go wrong there, but his essays, I think really do have this this clear sense um, that, that just is a through line across his career. And I hope everybody's doing well, as always. Thanks.